Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture, brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really nervous about how little time we have to discuss this, so let me, let me take a shot at, at this question, because you're kind of moving us into the question. So you're, not, you're actually making the case not whether we should do this, but almost that we have to do this, that, this is, that in thinking about mission and engagement, in, in thinking about how to function in a culture that has these stories that are, that are almost uh, omnipresent if I can say it that way, that, that we have to become com- conversant with, with the conversations that are, that are being generated, and, w- and we have to be able to do it with a wisdom and a discernment and a capability that can, that can tease out um, what's being sought for in and through these stories and what is being uh, – I'm going to be negative here a little bit – what's being sold through these stories. Those are not the same things. Um, and, uh, and to do, th- do so in a way that, that, uh, that invites a conversation with someone on the, outside, on the outside, if I can say it that way, but someone coming from a different place, maybe a better way to say it, um, that, that, uh, that uh, uh, reflects on the experience that we may or may not share with that person. Um, I mean, I can go into the most conservative church and I can say, how many of you have seen Schindler's List? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I have 95% raise their hand. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> how many of you have seen <clears throat> Bruce Almighty? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and 75% or 80% raise their hand. Mm-hmm. How many of you have seen uh, Finding Nemo? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I can, I can, I can create a, a list of shared experiences, mm-hmm. and then I can say, Name five books that you all have read. Mm-hmm. And they all say Huckleberry Finn because we had to read it in eighth grade. And, you know, they, they can yeah. maybe come up with three or four that are assigned in most curricula right. in public schools. Beyond that, nothing. Most people aren't aware that the statistics are that most people don't read at all. I mean, you know, that. Sixty percent of college grads mm-hmm. don't read one book for pleasure. That's amazing. I mean, if you think about it. And so, so I mean, that shows you how, how in our culture, although uh, particularly academics tend to operate out of a book world, if I can say it that way, um, the, most of the world operates in a very visual medium. Uh, in which they're not processing things <laughs> through outlines. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more like a web page. <clears throat> so um, that makes a big difference. Well, let's 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 talk about what this actually involves. Um, uh, what does it mean to engage in this conver- in these conversations? Um, in, in your view, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to pick an evaluative word because I don't know what el- other word to pick. Kind of a- authentically, in other words, not artificially, where 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 almost we get in the way of the conversation, if I can say it that way. I I think the first thing is you need to come wanting to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, in a couple days, <clears throat> I'm going to use. <clears throat> Excuse me, the fourfold method of interpretation mm-hmm. from the Middle Ages. Yes, and I'm going to use Lectio mm-hmm. and talk about Basil Pennington, mm-hmm. and he uses the word Lectio rather than read because he says you can read superficially. On the other hand, when I say to my friend or to my child, "I read you." Mm-hmm. That's more than just reading. Mm-hmm. That that that's saying I get you. That, right. That's saying I I I I'm involved. I've put myself in your place, mm-hmm. and I am on your wavelength. Mm-hmm. Now we can move on from there. Mm-hmm. I get you. I read you. Mm-hmm. That's what one has to do when they go to a movie mm-hmm. or when they watch a television show. If it's not just mindless escape mm-hmm. or Entertainment. It is entertainment, mm-hmm. but entertainment can be valuable. When entertainment's done well, it's reflective. It, it's reflective. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, it's not that it's not worth anything. Right. But when you enter into it for its own sake, allowing it 
to set the table for your conversation, mm -hmm. then you're able, as the Christian viewer, to say, thank you, I've learned this. Mm -hmm. And I have these questions of you. How, how would you respond? And whether that's to another viewer that you mm -hmm. are talking at Starbucks after seeing a movie, mm -hmm. or whether that's um, an internal conversation you have yourself with the movie, mm -hmm. you have that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. What I find is the exciting part of dealing with media is you're given permission as a culture to do that. Mm -hmm. I can go to Starbucks with you, Daryl, mm -hmm. and I can say, I thought that movie was awful. Mm -hmm. And you come back at me and say, it made me cry. Mm -hmm. That's the best movie I saw this year. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, Daryl, how could you say that? It was, <laughs> And you'll say, oh, but, and then you'll tell your narrative mm -hmm. as to why that connected with you. Right. And I'll say, thank you for sharing that. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Or or not. But, yeah, right. but you're able to really engage that. You're given social permission mm -hmm. to both agree and to confess mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a a, a story or a film or a movie, some, something from out of the popular culture. And in a sense, we expect it. Mm -hmm. We don't expect that in too many areas of life. That's true. And, that you, and it's almost when you go to a movie, or at least a good movie, that there are two tapes running, if I can say it. There's the movie, and then there's the movie of your lo own life experience yes. that runs and tries to connect to what it is that yeah. you're seeing, producing a reflection. And, and that I, I know when my wife and I go to see a really good movie, we can tell whether it's a really good movie or not by the conversation that happens after we walk out of yeah. the theater or immediately because it's either well there's nothing to talk about or or it's uh, man what did you think of that scene yeah. you know that raised some really interesting questions about life yeah. you, yeah. You, you immediately translated yeah. out of out of the story that you saw into the generic categories right. that the story is playing with or you might even go one step further and say you know that reminded me of Paul who died last year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so right. it's very not just, specific. you know, yeah, yeah exactly. but you, you are actually connecting right. with a point in your life right. in which it's almost too close, or at least it's revelatory in that discovering sense. And so the danger is, if I can say it this way, and I'm speaking now as someone who comes out of a very conservative background and who tends to view things, you know, well, first let's think about what Scripture says and then evaluate the experience. The, the danger is is that, it, is that by, if I can say it, injecting the book too early, um, you risk cutting yourself off from the experience that you are being asked to reflect on when in fact, to, to use where we started, it may be that sometimes the value is to work through the experience first, mm -hmm. come to grips with it, and <clears throat> then step back and say, all right, now where does this fit in the big scheme of things? I, I really think that's the case. Um, I've been criticized sometimes for saying you need to get yourself out of the way, and some scholars have come back, and I know where they're coming from, and in some sense they're right, to say you can never do that. Uh, but I want to say, when you're listening to another person, when your spouse is talking to you, mm -hmm. they know whether you're listening or not, mm -hmm. or whether you have an agenda that you're trying to respond right. quickly with. Right. And all I'm saying is not that your perspective as a Christian isn't fundamental. Mm -hmm. But your hospitality, mm -hmm. your generosity in relationship says, I want to listen to you. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want you to set the table for me. Mm -hmm. I want you to share your vision of life, mm -hmm. your – tell your story, whatever mm -hmm. that is. And then I'm happy to respond. And that response will come from my own center of power and meaning, which is my Christian faith. Mm -hmm. But it comes as a response. So it's it, you start with that experience. You connect first and, and then, then engage. And then you engage. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you take the New Testament, mm -hmm. I think that's what Paul does in Acts 17. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, you have some other places where the engagement is already there. When Peter was talking to a Jewish audience, mm -hmm. he didn't need to engage. They were mm -hmm. all Jews. They already were on the same page. He right. could just go for it. Right. Paul in Lystra or Paul in 
Athens, right? Those people don't have a clue. Well, exactly, about they don't what know the Genesis Jewish... from Malachi. No, they yeah. don't know one prophet. Yeah, They're, you're you're not going to. You have to somehow listen to them, and so Paul takes the time to say. Wow, you know, you really understand this is a spiritual world. You you recognize you don't even know that there's mystery there. Now, I don't much like your idolatry, and let me tell you about Jesus, but he starts with having listened to them. That's right. At that central point. Yeah, in fact, I, I, do, I do a message, I literally do around the country, I've done it around the world, in fact, on the comparison between Romans 1 and Acts 17. And the point that I make is, is that when Paul starts off and says, I see that you're very religious. Two verses before it said he was provoked looking at the idols, and you go, how in the world do you put that together? Well, the way liberal scholars put that together is the Paul of Acts 17 can't be the Paul who wrote Romans 1. And I go, no, nope, you just don't get it. You don't get the cross-cultural move that Paul has made with a lot of wisdom, which is that although he looks at the culture and he knows the culture has problems and that, and, and that you know, things are not great in the world and there's a need for God to step in and act, that there is, a, there is a spiritual quest that people are on that he's going to respect and then walk into. Right. As, and, and he's going to go and from he, there. And he's going to say it honestly. That's so right. So some commentators look at that and say, well, Paul was just uh, you know, s- uh, saying what they wanted to hear so he could really give it to them. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's dishonest. Yeah. I mean, Paul has listened enough that he can actually affirm mm-hmm. or at least describe that honestly mm-hmm. and then build on it. That's right. And that's what we're doing when we go to a movie, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Yeah. So, so that makes for a different kind of watching, I take it. Uh, I like to say that when you uh, – and, and I did this actually with a piece I did on the Noah movie where I said, you know, when Christians go to a faith, a film on faith, their tendency is to say, how does this match up with the Bible, and then they write the film in relationship to the, how it matches up with the details of the Bible. Of course, the problem you had with Noah is if you did a movie strictly on the script that you had in the Bible, it would be a short. Have you no know? It's <laughs> yeah. a silent movie. That's exactly right. It'd be <laughs> over before it started. So obviously there's going to be filling and things yeah. done. But what, what the movie did or attempted to do, I think, was to actually raise some very core questions about existence and choices that people face portray it very, very vividly. I actually think they did some mixture of, and this is a spoiler, so if you want to turn it off, go ahead. But uh, they, there actually was a mixture of, of the uh, Abraham and Isaac story in yes. the midst of Noah. Yes. You know, I got, when, when that move started to happen, I went, whoa, we've jumped ahead. But I, but I also at the same time got, I think, what the author was trying to do, which is to raise core life questions. Here's Noah going through this destruction of humanity that's happening before him, and there are core choices that he faces in the midst of that. And and I found myself in the movie saying, this is raising some pretty good core life questions that everybody has to wrestle with and contemplate to one degree or another unless they've totally turned themselves off to the existence that they live in. No, I I fully agree. Um, You know, the filmmaker, uh, uh, Darren Aronofsky, um, is a Jew, and his source material, he spent 10 years studying that scripture and studying commentator after commentator, but they were the Jewish commentators out of the Midrash. Absolutely. And that Midrashic tradition is more like the serendipity Bible series for evangelicals. Fair enough. (laughs) It, it, it tries to place you into the context and ask some questions. It's, it's not trying to be true to the text. It's trying to live the text. It's the text using the text as a lens into yes. life questions. Yes. So yes. the text is authoritative. Yes. And if you asked Aronofsky, he said, that's authoritative. Yeah. I was trying to – we were trying to deal with the story as given. Mm-hmm. But then we wanted to imagine, mm-hmm. man, if I had been Noah – Think of your serendipity. Yeah, you right. Know, how how could I be Peter in this story? If yeah. I had been Noah, mm-hmm. I would have had survivor's guilt. Mm-hmm. Now the Bible doesn't talk about that. That's mm-hmm. only one possibility. Mm-hmm. But you think about that. You and your little group are the only people alive, and you hear all those people yelling and groaning and knocking on the boat, mm-hmm. saying, "Let me in." Mm-hmm. You have to be feelingless. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, yeah. whether you whether you think that's necessary, whether that's what God's told you, there there got to be just a huge amount of anxiety and and 
sadness. I mean, even if, even if they're your enemy, mm-hmm. that kind of carnage. Well, so that's a question we in the Protestant tradition haven't usually asked of the text. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have taken that text and we have said it's about this good man, Noah, who saved the animals. Mm-hmm. That's the Noah story, as you know, probably you know, mm-hmm. Daryl, is the second most used story in all children's Bibles. Hmm. There's been a study on hmm. Google of 170 children's Bibles from the 19th to the 20th century. The Nativity, mm-hmm. number one, Noah, number two. More than the cross and resurrection, mm-hmm. more than the Good Samaritan, more than David and Goliath, more than Adam and Eve, hmm. Noah. And that story is always told as a story of this good person who rescues all these It's a preservation story. Yes. Yeah. Now, if that's your mindset, mm-hmm. that's what you've heard 150 times as a young boy or girl, mm-hmm. then Darren's movie is troubling mm-hmm. because he deals with the end of the story where Noah gets drunk. Mm-hmm. Well, why did he get drunk? Or he deals with the question where it says God was sad in his heart. Mm -hmm. And Aronofsky said, that's actually the the phrase that's the key to the whole story. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm not saying it's not. That's actually pretty key. But he has really looked at that text and talked about God's sadness and Noah's depression and those are also in the text, mm-hmm. but we somehow have just sanitized it, sanitized it or overlooked yeah. it for a different storyline. So actually, my own sense is the Noah story is um, raising all kinds of interesting perspectives, questions that we as Christians can benefit from. And reflect on. And reflect on, yep. even as we take it as our authoritative guide to life And even in those spots where we go, that doesn't fit the Bible, right. but the question that's being raised is a legitimate question Correct. I need to reflect on, which happens a lot. You, you've talked also some about uh, negative examples. I'm going to share one that I do that used to do with the message. There used to be a message I would preach on 1 Corinthians 13. You know the great love chapter, and I compared it to the lyrics of, and I'm gonna, I'm going way back here to the lyrics of a Tina Turner song. What's love got to do with it? And it was a contrastive piece. It was using what a message that was coming out of the culture that was that was different that we might even assess as negative, but I think it's more disengaged. It's almost tragic um, to, to ask the question, what's love got to do with, with things, is, is, is to me an opting out of a depth human experience that is sad because I don't who, – who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? You know, it, it's almost out of a fear of engagement, if you will. And, and, and so sometimes I think the way in which we handle – there's a way to handle culture and engage it and critique it, with, I think, without being, if I can say this, finger-shaking, just descriptive of, of, the, of the options that are put before people that they face when they think about, how do I handle love? That's an example of one using lyrics. Um, uh, what, what, so my question is this, with kind of that in the background, what advice would you give people as they think about watching movies and engaging movies or engaging music uh, you know, in a way that, that, tries to, that tries to listen and reflect? I would say that we're bombarded with culture from all sides. Um, not all of us are musicians. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're readers. Read. Not all of us are readers. We're visual. See movies. Mm-hmm. So first of all, do what you can relax and enjoy and, and move into. Mm-hmm. Secondly, um, <clears throat> I think that for any of us, we need both a community that we can talk to about our experiences and we need some sort of reflection that comes just from critics in the field. So if a movie has gotten a consistent half star, mm-hmm. why bother to see it? Right. Uh, yeah. So, so in, in five or ten minutes, one can figure out 
from the 25 movies that are available, these four or five might be interesting. And then given your taste and given your sensitivity, for example, I don't like horror movies. Mm -hmm. uh, they stay with me. Mm -hmm. My friend Scott Derrickson makes horror movies, is a strong conservative Christian hmm. who is committed to the fact that horror is the one genre where good is good and bad is bad, hmm. and that if there's any morality that needs to be emphasized, a horror movie does that best. Huh, interesting. Now, but it doesn't do best for me. Yeah, right. It's, for my kids, it's they, terrific see a horror, for you. <laughs> they see a horror movie and they go yeah. and ice cream and laugh yeah. and talk. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and For me, those images stay in ways that I don't find helpful. Right. So, so I, I make myself select. Yeah. So you have a critical selection. You have a personal choice. You have a, 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 a community of, conver of conversation afterwards. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think it's a lot easier than sometimes we think. Just, I, I think what, in some ways what I'm hearing kind of between the lines is just go and let the movie happen. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, and then and then and then wrestle. I, I don't know, wrestle may not be the right word, but let it take you where it takes you, and then reflect on where it's taking you. And and probably if you are not media savvy. You need to talk to a 20-year-old. Mm -hmm. My wife and I teach theology and film. We do a lot of group stuff, watching a movie together and then having people talk about it. And I would say the almost easiest group for us to interact with are high schoolers. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily know all of the critical moves, mm -hmm. but they get it. Mm -hmm. they're, they're visual thinkers. Mm -hmm. So that if you just feed them mm -hmm. a question that allows them to reflect on what they've seen. Mm -hmm. They're brilliant. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking, I don't know if we have time, but I'll, I'll make it yeah. short. Yeah. I make an assignment in class for, for all the students to um, have a discussion group in which they see a movie and then talk about it afterwards. And, mm -hmm. and it's a discipleship. It could be evangelism, but mm -hmm. a, a ministry opportunity. Mm -hmm. I had a Korean woman who had the assignment, and she went to her pastor and said, my professor has said, I need to show a movie uh, and, and have a discussion. And out of respect for professors, sometimes too much respect, as you <laughs> yeah, know, right, right. that Korean pastor and student said, well, then we'll need to show it in, in, in um, our church. So she picked X-Men. Hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> this doesn't sound That's like right. it will end well. That's right. These are first generation right. Korean language. <laughs> I mean, this is this this is going to be a tough one. Yeah. And, but so they had that Sunday night. Mm -hmm. Everybody came. All the youth came because uh -huh. it was a movie. Uh -huh. Gee, they never had yeah. that in church before. Right. All the old timers come because it's Sunday night. Right. The prayer meeting. They, they, they come. They want to be sure what their kids are getting so, into. Well, but they also <laughs> yeah. come because they're yeah. used to come. Yeah, you're right, right. Okay. So they all come. They see the movie. The movie's over. Mm -hmm. For the first time in that church, the youth are teaching the adults because mm -hmm. they're the only one that got it. Yeah, they're telling about wh what the two options are and uh -huh. how it functions uh -huh. and, and how there are mutants and those uh -huh. mutants have been rejected and and some of them want to revolt and others want to work in, within the system to try to make mm -hmm. it better. Okay, so they're talking for ten, well, half an hour, and then a little old lady. Mm -hmm. 85-year-old, hunched over, she stands up and she says, can I speak? And then she says, I know what it was like to be a mutant. Ooh. Mm. And then for the next period of time, those grandchildren hear their grandparents for the first time talk about they're coming to the States and feeling an outsider mm. and feeling unable to be who they are. Mm. Now, that's a wonderful conversation that just happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't you – didn't, you didn't have to set it up. Right. You, didn't, you, you simply showed the movie, asked people to reflect on it, learn from each other, and the sharing became a profound moment. Well, it, it you know uh, movie experiences are 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 
are challenging because they 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 strike different people in different ways. I like your picture of us going to Starbucks, seeing the same movie, and not seeing the same movie. <laughs> right. Uh, um, uh, and. And so they do make for a lot of conversation. They create a lot of opportunity to talk about things and issues that movies raise. And most good movies raise core issues about life. That's what makes them good movies. That's what makes yeah, them it's, more It's than what movie. makes a good story. That's right. I mean, a good story is scratching at life, is scratching at truth, mm-hmm. beauty, goodness. I mean, right. it, it's trying to say this is life. It's from this perspective, Mm -hmm. it's with these particular people, but it's actually making a claim on you, Mm -hmm. inviting you to say, I agree, or have you thought about this? I'm not. I'm not sure. That's where life yeah, is. And of course, plots are built around tension and yeah. choices. And so you find yourself in those good moments in difficult films, asking yourself, "If I were in these shoes, what would I do?" Or perhaps connecting to something that you've done in your life that reminds you, or what, however, it, however all that dynamic works. Uh, you know, I want to get. I'm, I'm trying to avoid doing what we what we said we were going, which is to overanalyze it. Uh, but, but there is. A sense in which a good movie experience takes you to places that otherwise you might not be inclined to go, mm-hmm. uh, and in doing so, uh, produces avenues for conversation and reflection that you might not otherwise get to. And the beauty of it, from my standpoint, is in a in a in a theater in which you're sitting next to someone who may never darken the door of a church or have a friend who may never darken the door of a church. Now you have a way into a conversation about life issues that is that is trying to get to the same place you'd love to have a conversation with that person about, but it's coming through a different door. Absolutely. And, and through that different door, you have the opportunity to, to actually have the conversations you've longed to have but right. f- but have been unable to get to because because the moment you do it uh, theologically and ecclesiastically the person is shut down that's correct no we uh, you know again in that assignment where I have people uh, show a movie in group and talk about it it as more than once people have said I showed it to my small group in my small group, we had come to a level of, of, of stasis. We, we mm-hmm. would be this vulnerable, mm-hmm. but no more vulnerable. Mm-hmm. We, we knew the limits of what we could talk about. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, we saw this movie, and it was vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Its personal presence mm-hmm. was open, transparent, which caused one or two of us to respond from the same vulnerability. That reminded me of mm-hmm. this which I'm facing or this experience I had, which then caused others to be vulnerable. And all of a sudden, there was a new point of transparency for the whole group mm-hmm. that stayed there even in future conversations. Right. Um, I, I personally think that, that uh, films, maybe films' chief gift to us is that it allows us a perspective on life that we otherwise might not see. Mm -hmm. So we're allowed into the shoes of a blind person, or we're allowed to see the the struggle of an alcoholic, Mm -hmm. or whatever. But but we we can understand, feel, um, experience in a way that we probably otherwise can't, mm-hmm. and that uh, that expands our lives. Mm-hmm. That allows empathy and understanding with other people that we then will meet. Mm. Um, we're just as when you meet someone who has had a life changing event. I'll go back to the the seven-year-old daughter or son who died. You're a different person for having befriended that person. Mm -hmm. You you look at life differently. You you thank God that that wasn't your experience. You, you, You feel blessed that somehow You've been spared that pain. You wonder if you could have gotten through, through that it. pain. Exactly. You, yeah. you, you know, there's all kinds. But, but you are a fundamentally different person for having had that experience. And maybe it's different in film, but it, 
there's a lot of discussion, as you know. I mean, right. there's a lot of theoretical conversation about these second order experiences and uh, what you're yeah. to make of them. But but they actually are experiences. They they make a difference in who we are. Well, our, our time unbelievably is already up. The the, uh, the the credits are getting ready to roll. Uh, but uh, Robert, I want to thank you for coming in and talking with us and kind of introducing us to this area uh, for our reflection. And my hope would be that uh, that the conversation uh, generates uh, some reflection on perhaps those who listen to think about films and in a in a different and fresh kind of way and, and think about the opportunities that they actually represent, not just. Uh, for how we engage our culture, but also for thinking through what it can mean for us in our own personal reflection about how uh, God is walking with us uh, through what through what what it draws us to contemplate. So thank you very much for being a part of this, and we thank you. Thanks, Daryl. You're really very welcome. It. You're very welcome, and thank you for being a part of the table where we discuss issues in God and culture, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks for listening to the Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Wow.